Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for attending this event, either in person or virtually. We are extremely excited to talk about a relatively unexplored topic between two areas of study that are rarely in conversation, animal rights and reproductive justice. The purpose of this event is to build solidarity between these disciplines and better understand the ways in which reproductive control and exploitation is an interspecies issue. My name is Asha Ramakumar, and I'm a CEO here at the Law School, and I'm the co-president of the Animal Law Society. I want to give a special thank you to the Harvard Animal Law Society, the Alliance for Reproductive Justice, and the Brooks McCormick Animal and Law Policy Program for co-sponsoring this event. I also want to advise everybody that this event is being recorded. Before we begin our panel, I want to take a moment to do some acknowledgments and introduce our esteemed panelists. First, for a land acknowledgement, Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to these people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Additionally, I'd like to do an enslavement acknowledgement in honor of the enslaved whose labor created wealth that made possible the founding of Harvard Law School. May we pursue the highest ideals of law and justice in their memory. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First on the far left is Professor Michelle Goodwin. Professor Goodwin is a chancellor's professor at the University of California, Irvine, the founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy, and is the Abraham Panaski Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Professor Goodwin received her JD from Boston College Law School, her LLM and SCJD at the University of Wisconsin, and was a Gilder Lerman postdoctoral scholar at Yale University. Professor Goodwin has contributed groundbreaking scholarship on legal questions related to freedom of speech, religious exercise, equal protection, due process, race and sex discrimination, reproductive rights, slavery, and LGBTQ equality. She's credited with helping to establish and shape the health law field. Professor Goodwin is the author of the award-winning book, Policing the Woo, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, and is the host of the podcast on the issues with Ms. Magazine. Next, right next to me is Professor Kristen Stokes. Professor Stokes is a professor of law at Harvard Law School and is the faculty director of the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program and is also the director of the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World. Professor Stokes received her JD from the University of Texas School of Law and holds a PhD in History and Middle Eastern Studies from Harvard University. Professor Stokes' research focuses on Islamic law and society in both historical and contemporary contexts as well as in the area of animal law and the intersection of animal law and religion and culture in particular. In 2021, Professor Silk published her piece, Rights of Nature, Rights of Animals in the Harvard Law Review, wherein she illustrates how developments and achievements in the field of environmental rights and specifically rights of nature can be instructive intellectually and practically to the cause of animal protection and animal rights. She is currently working on publications related to halal meat and international and comparative animal law. And lastly, joining us virtually is Dr. Catherine Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie is a writer, multi-species ethnographer, and feminist geographer. Dr. Gillespie's research and teaching interests focus on feminist and multi-species theories and methods, including agriculture, political economy, and critical animal studies. She is the author of the book, The Cow with Your Tag 1389, a book about the lives of cows in the U.S. dairy industry. She has also published in numerous scholarly journals and has co-edited three books, Vulnerable Witnesses, Critical Animal Geographies, and Economies of Death. Her forthcoming book is The Sound of Feathers, Haunting and Bearing Witness in Multi-Species World. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get into our moderated questions, and we will have time for open Q&A at the end of our panel. So to begin, first, our first question is for Professor Goodwin. As the title of the event says, uh, what does it mean to exploit and commodify a body? Well, first, thank you for moderating this important panel and for hosting us. So when I think about the relevance of this convening, it comes in as so when I think about the relevance and the importance of this convening, I think it's uh, important that we start off 
with some clarity, particularly for those who might even be offended by the notion that we could talk about um, human reproduction and also uh, speak in the same voice about what it means to protect uh, animals, particularly given the United States history of chattel slavery, where uh, individuals who were kidnapped uh, from the Shivas of Africa and then sex and labor traffic were held at the status of animals of property uh, were in fact in law no higher than the status of mules in the fields. I mean, that's the reality of our law. <clears throat> But at the same time, I think that it's important to recognize that the campaign for freedom, the campaign for equality and for dignity was something that is not confined to human beings, but that is actually the charge that we have ahead for our planet. And with that, I think it's important to recognize that for those in fact, who were the stewards of this land as it began with, uh, the steward of lands in Africa and Asia, uh, were committed to uh, an ecosystem that respected um, animals. And I think that we see that today, right? And it's interesting to think about the power of the poacher. The power of the poacher and what that means in terms of uh, histories in the United States that we tend not to think about. That is the poachers who would poach women from the shores of Africa and then would place them in the context of being breeding witches, a term that's actually used in advertisements, right? People being bartered and sold to breed. And then the same that we can see in terms of the exploitation of animals as well. Um, the final point that I'll make, and I you know we have other questions to unpack, um, is that so much of what I think traumatizes us um, with regard to the erosion of uh, reproductive autonomy, the cruel ways in which we see animals being exploited, is that so much of that has its historical foundations in who possesses power and how power is wielded. And so as we have this conversation today, I think that power is an important part of that conversation um, because I think it threads through in so many ways. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Gillespie, I'd like you to also answer that question and maybe more specifically, you could speak to and what bodies are we talking about and in what ways are they being commodified and exploited and how would you, I guess, characterize that? I'm oh, sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I, I also just wanted to say thank you for organizing this. It's um, it's exciting to be a part of this conversation and I, um, I totally agree that it's a um, conversation that needs to to sort of happen more and um and develop in new directions of sort of solidarity and thinking across species lines on these issues um i think just speaking so my work has been primarily focused on um non-human animals and um human animal relations um mostly in the um in food in food and agriculture um and um even more specifically than that in the dairy industry and more recently thinking about the um the beef industry and um i think that what's interesting about um th thinking about animals um today and sort of what it means to commodify um their bodies and particular species because um there's certainly not um, kind of even consideration or um, kind of freedom of commodification um, for for all species. Um, I think that so if if we take the the dairy um, cow as an example, um, there's these layers of commodification that occur um, in the dairy industry. So um, animals as uh, property as uh, is it. Um, creates a designation that makes them ownable and um, 
sellable and viable. Um, and so they're very like life and body is commodified and can be exchanged in the market. Um, but in terms of the reproductive, so that's sort of the starting point um, for their kind of um, legal and uh, material um, kind of de designation um, and experience of the world. Um, but then, then in terms of the sort of reproductive um, layers of um, the of the dairy cow, um, and I think this is applicable to other, um, you know, certainly other species um, in agricultural and other industries. Um, but the reproductive capacities of um, the animals are. Um, are commodified. So I've done a, a lot of um, field work in livestock auction yards, and um, these are spaces where um, the sort of discourses and narratives that circulate in the act of selling and buying of um, cows are about, you know, like how many more pregnancies she has um, before she's sort of spent. Um, how uh, just sort of like um, discourses on fertility and those kinds of things. So there's like the reproductive capacity, which is kind of a discursive. Um, I mean, certainly it's an embodied um, kind of reality and capacity, but it's also a discursive kind of narrative um, around which um, these ideas of sort of um, reproduction um, get circulated. And then there's another layer, which is the reproductive outputs um, that come from um, appropriating um, animals' reproductive lives. Um, in the case of dairy cows, um, we have the, the reproductive outputs are, of course, the calves. Um, cows have to be impregnated um, annually. They have a nine-month gestation period, and so they um, give birth to cows. The calves are um, taken away. They're commodified in particular ways um, and for, um, for veal, for um, sort of re-entering the dairy industry for semen production um, if they're male. And then, um, and then, so there's calves and then there's also milk that comes out of, um, comes out of uh, that sort of reproductive um, process that's commodified. And um, so I think there's, you know, I, I don't want to go on too long, um, but then there's the sort of post, um, post, dairy kind of post um, active reproductive um, commodification and that's in um, sort of spent uh, spent cows for um, for meat and then beyond the slaughterhouse um, the disposal of um, re their remains that can't be um, integrated for human consumption and so that goes into rendering for all of these other products so really from birth beyond death um, animals are commodified um, in these particular ways, and, and many of those ways are oriented around um, the reproductive process and the appropriation of, um, of those bodies, both female and male. Um, there's some really interesting stuff to think about in terms of the um, semen industry where um, semen is extracted from bulls and circulated um, as sort of global capital in the reproduction of of cows um, through artificial insemination. So yeah, I'll just, I'll stop there, but um, that's the way that I've been thinking about um, kind of the commodification of the body in the non-human animal context. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Gletsky. And so I guess my follow-up question to that, and I'll start with Professor Stilt is with that being said, as Dr. Gletsky is talking about kind of using the outputs and the body itself as a method of exchange in, in, as capital, how then does the law downstream of that conceive of bodily autonomy? And that if, if the body is itself or its outputs are to be conceived as capital, what does that say about the autonomy of the being itself? And how does the law conceive of that? Um, sure, do you want to do the video or after? Maybe answer them, you can show. No, but okay, I have a short clip to explain. <laughs> Visualizes a lot of this and it's not. It's not meant to be distressing. It's actually an industry uh, video, but um, the very fundamental uh, fact, <clears throat> the overall, that's why I haven't strong, is that there is no economy. There is no bodily economy of any kind. So we've mostly been speaking about farm animals, which I think is appropriate today because 90% of the animals that we use in this country are going into the food supply. And these animals are, are money. There's no question about it. They are money. And the ideal way to maximize your money is to produce the most offspring. 
And so uh, what an animal may want is completely irrelevant. It's about producing the most offspring and continuing that process as fast as you can, as rapidly as you can, and with the most offspring per cycle that you can. And that is, as you mentioned, when the female is slowing down in her reproductive, she's marked as, as killed. So she goes off to be killed for me because she's no longer serving the function of essentially being a machine. If that is really what we're talking about. We're talking about reproductive machines in which it's a highly regulated, controlled environment. There are there's genetic, there's genetic selection, there's sex selection, sex selection, there's hybridization to find the cow who can produce the most dairy or the, the kind of calf with the most marble in their meat. And there's no bodily autonomy of any disease, not when you're impregnated, not when you get birth, not how you're able to treat the, um, your offspring, not whether you can lactate and breastfeed or anything, which for pigs and can for a little while, for calves, since the whole point of the dairy industry is to provide milk for humans, the calves are not allowed any of that milk of the mother. So uh, it's there, there is no bodily autonomy. And, and just to say that the reason why I think these issues can really productively be talked about together is that my sense, my hunch, maybe this will come out more today, is that while the experiences will, of course, be different, the approach, the approach to control, the way of thinking about the commodification of bodies is not dissimilar. So not these experiences, but the approach, the technology, the companies, right, who are thinking about these things, the mentality, um, it's, it's part and parcel. Of, of the same. And so I'm really pleased and thank you for convening this. I hope that um, some joint writing could come out of this and, uh, and some other projects. Thank you, Professor Goodwin. You know, I'd love you to speak to kind of the tail end of Professor Stoltz's comment. What, what parallels are you seeing in human reproductive discourse too? So our coming together reminds me of the work that I do in biotechnology and law in my casebook, Biotechnology, Bioethics and the Law. And it traces in many ways the kind of arc of this conversation where I should start off with food. And there are videos that I show my students about the ways in which uh, animals are uh, treated in terms of food supply. So students become very surprised that uh, to stuff the cow, it means that they are eating candy, for example, sort of cheap candy um, being sold very, very cheaply to the industries where then cows eat the things that we discard and things that are not healthy for them. And of course, this comes into the human body. And then, of course, as you were just mentioning, um, the ways in which there is deep monitoring in every aspect of the reproductive process. It's an interesting thing because we also see ways in which as human beings, there are some purchasing into systems. I mean, I think about assisted reproductive technologies, which a lot of people in this room probably embrace, but it has some of the same kinds of uh, aspects as we're talking about in terms of what happens to uh, cows, for example. And there are other animals as well. We see that in the horse industry as well, the studying and so forth. But again, it gets to questions about who has the power of choice, right? Um, and there's also questions about violence as well, which I think are really important to introduce in this conversation, um, as well as you know, questions about how do we treat um, individuals who are in service of a larger economy? So even thinking about um, human reproduction and what does it mean when there's coerced reproduction that people don't want? What kind of dignity is there and what kind of dignity is there in how children are treated after birth? And so it's a very interesting thing when I you know, sort of think about, for example, uh, rollbacks with regard to food stamps, Roll, uh, rollbacks um, in terms of welfare, this kind of policing of what it is that you will have access to in terms of a dignified life. In recent years, you may have heard about, because it's taking place quite a bit on the East Coast, of children being penalized for not being able to afford their lunch. 
And now this means that if you were not able to pay the fee for having lunch the year before, you don't get to go on field trips. And what does it say about the use of power and power is used in economic ways and power is used in economic ways that are also violent and restrictive? And so when I think about these questions, and if we're thinking about a longer thread, which is a conversation that you're pulling together for us, then we have to think about matters that are not just about birth, but that are also about dignity, and that are also about how uh, offspring are treated, which is exactly what you were speaking to. And this is part of a human dynamic, and it is also a shared commonality when we think about what is happening, certainly in the dairy industry um, and beyond. In fact, it's really quite appalling what we see in the dairy industry, but it's also equally appalling what we see in terms of what people with capacity for pregnancy and women are being subjected to who do not want to reproduce and are being coerced by states to reproduce um, and in ways that are actually quite risky to their lives. So I'll end on this because I think it's part of what we've heard before, but in the human context, I haven't said it. So the United States leads all industrial nations in terms of maternal mortality and morbidity. We rank around 55th in the world. Um, Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi kind of rotate in terms of being the deadliest places in all of the industrialized world to be pregnant. The Supreme Court in 2016, in a case, a whole woman's healthy Heller said, acknowledged that a woman is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion. So it's very interesting to sort of think about then the political backdrop of what it means to be placed in a position where you have no other choice but in fact to reproduce and that this choice is not being made by the individual whose body is being used in that capacity, but instead by lawmakers. And then to complicate this, just one twist more, right now there is a Senate hearing on the Equal Rights Amendment and it's a very interesting thing to think about that in terms of which, you know, what does equality in body um, actually mean with the backdrop of this. In the Dobbs decision, Justice Alito, who wrote the opinion for the majority, said that if, in fact, there are people who are dissatisfied with that ruling, then they can take their concerns to the political process. Then it is really worth us getting down to the nuts and bolts of what does that actually mean in a state like Mississippi, right? That's part of the origin of how I began my remarks here. But even thinking about Mississippi today, where nearly 87% of the legislature happens to be male, and the petition over time for the state to address these very important issues in the state's legislature, where only three women even chair any committees amongst the dozens that are there, that helps us, I think, to further set the conversation. So thank question. you. I think you know we can show the millennial farmer video. Okay, good. Now we have some I think that's a good segue some into your session. Uh, yeah. topics here. So this is a promotional video showing a family farm in Wisconsin. I'm just showing you the part about about revolution. And it's changed it's really changed the way we dare. Hey, Greg, where are we now? And are my children safe in there? Yeah, these are the non ravenous uh, herbivore, not the carnivore variety of. Oh, not the not carnivore animal. type of cow. Yeah, all of our calves born in the last day or two, they come in here, we dry them off, we give them all the vaccines, all the medicines, give them a great dose of colostrum, which is mother's milk, and kind of get them get a good start to their life. And then they go out to an individual hutch after that. So once they're born, they come in here. Get some real good TLC. Think of this as the uh, nursery in the hospital. You can see some of our breeding strategy. We have the black and whites, which are Holsteins, which are the best yep. by far. Yep. By far. And uh, then we have some almost pure black calves over there. Those are limousine cross. Why are you breeding both? We talked a little bit in the podcast about sex semen and how we can basically impregnate a cow with a female within 90 plus percent yep. um, accuracy. From a dairy, we want the females to produce milk. The males basically get raised and, and turned into food, turned into to the great steaks that everyone enjoys. Yep. And the beef industry tends to gain a little more of a uh, margin or a little more of a premium 
than a Holstein steer, Holstein male. So then we're we're working on crossbreeding for our non the the mothers we do not want heifers out of or females out of that are going to go to meat production. We're putting beef semen in them, so they're they're coming up with this black limousine Angus cross. Just to hit on a little bit about what you said there, what you glanced over, if they didn't hear the podcast, you're actually able to yep. when you Im- impregnate the cow. Well, I'm going to start by saying, listen to the podcast. Listen to listen there you to go. The Off the husk podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but when we, uh, every year in a, in a perfect world, you want a cow to have a baby every year, every 365 days, you need a certain number of replacements. Cause as cows get older and you will have turnover in your herd, so you need the female replacements to come in. Semen's either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. Yep. And X is female, Y is male. And you can, uh, separate the two and only breed a cow to X chromosome semen, female semen, and she will basically conceive a female. So then you know your desirable moms that you want daughters out of, uh, you are going to want females out of them, essentially. And you breed those to get females out of, and the ones that maybe aren't do as well, or maybe some corridors, you're gonna you're gonna uh, not necessarily want their offspring, so you're breeding to the, to the beef market. Right? Why do you take these things away from their mom at one day old? Couple of reasons we do. One, we want that calf to be in a warm, dry, safe environment right away. A lot of times, if you're in a herd mentality or a group, that cow can have that calf. Uh, they are animals. Uh, another cow can come in, accidentally step on it. Um, there's some social uh, social dominance issues that they might not like having a newborn in there with them. I mean, they don't have the brain capacity that you and I do. Some might, argue, some might argue that, that I but I, anyway, that say yeah, a whole we, lot. We, that's, the jury's out. <laughs> but then we want to take them and we want to put them in a, a nice temperature controlled, clean environment, give them some vaccinations, give them uh, some colostrum, give them a, 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 a belly full of warm mother's milk with full of nutrients, full of passive immunity of that to get that calf as much the, high, uh, the highest um, immune system strength right away so she can fight, she or he can fight anything that comes at them. Uh, and want to give them a vaccine and we dip their navels with iodine. That's that's the umbilical cord. That's a nice disinfectant for that area. And then let them make sure they get all four feet on the ground and then move them out to an individual hut. And that does a few things. It isolates disease and makes sure that calf is going to get everything it needs to be successful. If you leave her out with Mother Nature, which is good. Hey, you kids, quiet down. Taking a video here. It's important. Yeah. Uh, Come on now, get. Not every calf is going to have the instinct to get up and get what it needs in that first 12 hours. And not every mom is going to be a good mom. So wait till that's done. (laughs) Can't catch a break around here. So so much going on. That last remark before the sheen went on was not every mother is going to be a good mom. You probably heard that. Mm-hmm. If you didn't, I'm emphasizing. Mm-hmm. Can and I just say really quickly, quickly yeah. one of the things that um, this video brings to mind um, a statement that Thomas Jefferson made uh, about the breeding winches on his plantation, which is that it was overstated the use of uh, enslaved Black men on plantations. He wrote in a letter to uh, his nephew, who is also a politician in Virginia, that really to be a good planter, which is what plantation owners called themselves, you needed to have enslaved women on your plantations because they were turning profit every year or two. And clearly that was all about reproduction and being forced to breed. It wasn't about their ability to pick cotton any better than black men, but it was about the profit specifically connected to their forced reproduction. Because you want to show that one, there's just an image that appeared earlier in the video. That's the, the app on his phone where he can track every single, so you see like exactly for every cow who has a number, um, you know, exactly what's going on with them, their insemination date, their due date, how many inseminations they've had. Um, you know, so that, like you said, 365 days, ready to go, right? One more insemination. So thank you for And uh, in, at a time in which the government has sought to track women and their uh, periods and gestations. 
Yeah, it's probably the same technology. It's probably the same Right. I would love to get this. this word. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gillespie, I would love to get your reactions to that video and also ask you, and then as a follow up, uh, Professor Goodwin, what types of appropriation of scientific terms of language and of tropes are, are at play in, in this discussion? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm usually so much better about that. Um, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, that's, there's a lot that, there's so much to say about that, um, that video. I mean, it's just packed with um, really um, curious statements um, about, uh, about motherhood. I think that one of the, um, what, one of the things that does come up through the industry is this like sense that that cows aren't going to be good enough mothers and so there needs to be this like um kind of surrogate of the farmer and often that's a male farmer um you know as the sort of stand in um stand in mother as a um a little aside i was um at the I was part of a group that got a back um, behind the scenes tour of the rhino exhibit at the Buffalo Zoo, and they had recently, at the time, um, successfully um, artificially inseminated the female rhino with a dead rhino's um, frozen semen, and then the um, both the the rhino keeper and um, another person. Uh, man and woman like frame themselves who were involved in the insemination frame themselves as the rhino as the baby rhino's parents um and sort of just to, like divorced this um you know rhino or in um in the dairy industry's case you know calves from that maternal um relationship which um in terms of sort of uh, studies on um ethology and behavior um in uh in cows, um, there is a you know very strong maternal bond among um, you know cows and their calves and and the bigger um, herd uh, kind of herd dynamics um, as a whole. Um, so there's just I think interesting um, kind of discourses there. The other thing that stood out to me is the um, idea of. Uh, this technology, the, the sort of increasing um, technological um, kind of uh, inputs in the industry. So the the sort of app tracking um, fertility and those kinds of things, temperature, um, and also um, other kinds of reproductive technologies. So the dominant um, method has been um, for quite a while, artificial insemination. Um, but more recently, there's um, developed uh, practice of embryonic transfer technology um, where um, a sort of superior, like superior um, genetic, a cow with superior genetics um, is, uh, produces like 10 to 20 um, embryos and then those are transferred into um, surrogate cows. And the reason for doing this is one that the genetic, like that you get more of the genetics um, that you want. Um, and, you know, as they said in the video, they, you know, can get one, usually one calf a year, sometimes, um, you know, cows have twins, but really like one calf a year. And so this creates 10 to 20 um, calves originating from one um, one cow. So there's like constantly all these technological innovations that are focused on um, efficiency and um, sort of an intensifying um, commodification um, of the the body and the reproductive um, capacity, sort of making even more out of um, each cow and and what they can produce. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, just the the one last thing I um, wanted to say when um, just sort of thinking about the um, kind of discursive similarities um, in terms of the like uh, like gendered narratives that come up um, both in human contexts around um, around women and um, their sort of uh, reproductive uh, role and um, and cows in the industry or other um, female animals in in these industries is that there's um, these kind of a super conservative um, you know narratives about like women women 
be like their primary value being um, in their capacity to reproduce the a woman's role is um, is as uh, a mother um, and that that's sort of the um, normative expectation for women that we're just seeing this sort of intensive like re-intensifying of those those values um, post Dobbs and in our current contemporary context and um, I wanted to share just a couple of quotes from um, the industry, dairy industry material, advertising materials are just like a gold mine of um, discourses similar to this video and also specifically like sort of discourses around um, like gendered commodification and, uh, and, and sexualized forms of violence. Um, and so one one set of ads um, for for this vaccine um, called Bovashield Gold says, if she can't stay pregnant, what else will she do? Keep your cows pregnant and on the job. Ask your Pfizer animal health representative to protect her pregnancy, your pre reproductive program, and your bottom line. So of course, there's this norm, like if she can't stay pregnant, what else will she do that I think really kind of um, resonates with with discourses around human women and reproduction and and these sort of conservative values. Um, a lot of the rural communities are um, and and farmers are embedded in a more conservative um, orientation to thinking about gender roles. And so there's a lot of resonance there. Um, and then the same um, one other short quote from from that same set of advertisements is pregnancy loss is all too common, but it doesn't have to be 200 to 400 dollars the value of each pregnancy. Um, so there's this attachment um, of um, in this case monetary value um, to 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 each pregnancy, but I think that that also translates into thinking about um, kind of cultural um, cultural capital, maybe, and the the sort of very um, yeah the, um, the the ways that value is attached is attached to each pregnancy. I think there's something there that that could um, have some re resonances between human and animal. Um, context. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, well, I think that Dr. Gillespie framed it really so well. So, so thank you so much. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, what was offered so so brilliantly there. There is a discourse about uh, efficiency that one sees that runs um, through both aspects, and I want to pick up on um, an aspect of reproduction that um, ties quite directly um, between power, politics, humans, and, and also uh, other mammals. And that is thinking about eugenics. So we are nearly at the 100 year anniversary of the Buck v. Bell case, where Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said three generations of imbeciles are enough. The power that the state has to impose inoculation is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. He says, rather than to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Uh, this ruling, uh, which is actually the second version of his written opinion, it is said that the first one was even more notorious, but it basically opened the door to eugenics broad scale in the United States. 1927 wasn't the first year that there was a eugenics law that was from 1906 in Indiana, but this certainly did give the imprimatur of the Supreme Court for the spread of eugenics throughout the United States. And during that period of time at state fairs, where now there would be the pinning of the blue ribbon on the cow or the pig, et cetera, was the pinning of such ribbons and things like that, quite literally, on American families that were thought to be the fittest families. And if you want to see any of the iconography associated with this, then go online to the Library of Congress and you can see just what this kind of campaign meant that what we do today with horses and sheep and cows was in fact what we were doing with American people. And this idea that you could breed a stronger, fitter race of people, and of course this was all thought within the context of white people. There wasn't a kind of thought that 
you know, the uber human could be indigenous or of African extraction or from Asia, but it was very much a white campaign that ultimately ends up being borrowed and adopted by the Nazis in Germany. And there comes a time in which American lawmakers are saying, we need to speed this up because the Germans are beating us at our own game. Later on in Nuremberg, the affirmative defense that is offered by the doctors was how dare you Americans come and prosecute us when we borrow directly from you. But this campaign of the breeding and moving towards the fittest has also resonance within this context. And if you trace this line, you'll find an overlap between the organizations that promoted um, a kind of eugenics thinking about human beings with an overlap of eugenical thinking about animals too, mm -hmm. including dogs and uh, farmers. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, a straight line um, in terms of milk and the idea that you want, you want to have the perfect race, you want the perfect family, you want the strongest, the most capable, milk. Milk is the solution. And uh, Mitchell Cohen, who's an exceptional scholar of milk, has written incredible work about milk essentially being racist. Um, because, you know, the, uh, the people who are least likely to um, digest cow's milk, which was never meant for humans to start with, right, is not neutral when you look at the map of lactose uh, intolerance. And so, um, you sort of nodded. I don't know what you said. Uh, well, my thinking is the exploitation of Black women as uh, to nurse white babies during slavery and during Jim Crow. And it's interesting that it, with the case Plessy v. Ferguson, you know, you, you've all read Plessy or parts of it. The piece that probably isn't talked about in your con law class is the exception of who could actually be in the car with white people. And it was the Black nurse, right, who would be nursing the babies, which is a fascinating thing, right? So, you know, how do we address race and sex and the commodification of people's bodies within that context? What are the ways in which you can enter into and exit out of systems of exploitation? Oh, in that case, it does not, right? So the use of a black woman to serve in the milk producing capacities, of course, highly problematic. Um, say the least. So when we so let's look at it on the on the dairy side for a minute, you know, you heard him say some things that were just um, complete euphemisms. And I think if you know, one one thing I really want to talk about is is about seeking the truth, and then how we lose that truth, how we how we forget it, or maybe we're afraid to say it because it doesn't seem politically palatable. But that milk was not meant for us was meant for the cows. And in order to sell it to us, they have to take the cows away and make sure the cat gets not one, one drop of them. What a troubling uh, metaphor, but it is there. So recently I was speaking at an event at the Aspen Institute about these issues. And, and actually some of the audience brought up the issue about black women in nursing. And there were three women in this audience who spoke about a kind of cellular level trauma associated with nursing and what this meant for black women who had babies that they were not able to nurse because they were nursing uh, white babies and they unable to provide to their offspring what they would have wanted uh, because of these systems that have been baked into our society. Mm -hmm. they, thank you all so much. And so on that note, you know, we're these parallels through language and through just experience is coming out. So my, my question that I'll end on before we go to open Q&A is, you know, the reproductive justice movement is a social justice movement that has gained a lot of traction, but that is not necessarily paralleled in the animal context. So my question for everybody who could answer it briefly is, you, how, are, how is, do we build solidarity between these movements or lack thereof without making equivalencies or I'll have you answer that however you you see fit and we'll we'll start with you Professor Goodwin. Well it's a, it's, a, it's a great question and I think that 
you all in this room are part of the next um, kind of framing of what we need in our society in order to sustain, and that is thinking about environmental justice, which is I see as a through line through all of this, thinking about matters uh, with regard to climate change, how do we protect our planet, I think um, fundamentally ties to these kinds of questions, um, how do we shape a society that uh, respects the dignity of all, um, and that does not lead into what I've been describing as pornographies of pain. When you think about what we have subjected um, animals to, and I think about the poaching that takes place in continents um, of Asia, Africa, and that kind of violence, and then I think about the kind of that's celebrated and captured in film and video where people are very proud of the capture. And I think about that within the history of the United States, too, the sort of pride of a lynching, including a lynching of a pregnant Black woman. This kind of pornography of pain, I think, is something that we need to tap into and that we need to address and that we need to confront mm -hmm. in order to get beyond. Thank you. Professor Stillich. I would just say that it's great that we're all here and you're all hearing all of this because I feel like um, in my many conversations, oftentimes people will say to me, Look, I'm working on human issues. I just don't have time to think about animal issues or secondary. I don't have time to think about what I eat. I'm in a hurry. I just grab something. I don't have time to think about what I drink. I just, you know, whatever it is. And I guess what I want to say is that these systems are so interconnected that if we just sit down and talk to each other, we can really, we can really see that. And so I think none of us can really assume that anything is a neutral product or is not the product of suffering. Of course, you know, to some extent, we're in a world in which everything we do is, is, is damaging to the environment. Um, but there are, there are gradations, and I think that we always need to be thinking as it's our responsibility, really, to say, I care about this. I just don't have time to care about that. Because when we do that, when we separate ourselves, we will be, we will be defeated. Right? We have to really pull together. And care about these interlocking issues. Thank you. And uh, Dr. West could ask me the same question as well. Um, yeah, I think that, oh good, I'm not muted. <laughs> um, I, I, I think for me, um, it's, uh, there are, it's sort of a, a balance between trying to understand the kind of like underlying logics and structures that, um, that create the conditions for, um, exploitation of of humans and and racialized humans and um and non-human animals um that you know for instance um we can understand i think that i think the the benefit of look or one of the benefits of looking at um farmed animals or animals um used in labs or or other industries and the way that they're commodified is that currently it's just such a like raw kind of glaringly um I don't want to say obvious because a lot of people aren't thinking about it, but but it's a, such an easy thing to see if you look at it, like how the body is commodified, and then the um, the consequences of that commodification um, in a way that I think helps us understand better um, the the ways that that commodification of um, of human and non-human bodies have occurred throughout history, and and then the more insidious ways um, in terms of the human context that these things come up, but have been um, more and more kind of obscured. Um, and so that I think you know, and I, I hesitate to say that like you know, I think looking at animals' experience is important for animals. It does get you know, I think it kind of sometimes gets framed as like, well, looking at animals helps us understand human, but humans better. And so that's the motivation for doing that. I, um, I think that these need to be seen as like, um, as really distinct um, contexts that um, affect, you know, bodies and lives differently. Um, but that, that there are things that we can understand um, more deeply um, through, through looking at this. I mean, one thing I, I didn't say earlier about um, the commodification is, is the way land is commodified, both the like colonial framing of um, land as property and incorporation of, you know, all land in um, North America as, uh, well, and elsewhere as, um, 
as property and the impact of um, settler colonialism on that, um, that framing, um, and then that, you know, how that carries forward um, in terms of, you know, like land, public land is leased to ranchers at a really um, low um, rate to, to graze, um, graze animals, and that puts pressure on these local ecosystems, um, as well as continuing to dispossess indigenous humans and wildlife from their like ancestral lands. And so I think that, you know, there's just like a real web of, of specific um, kind of contextualized examples um, that that there are sort of underlying logics that can can be sort of excavated um, and hopefully then you know more productively responded to through understanding a more kind of a fuller fuller view of how of how these logics um, kind of manifest in different contexts. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, I think we are a bit short on time for open Q and A, but I will offer if you'd like to send me an email, I am happy to reach out to all of our panelists to answer any of your questions um, that you might have. But uh, before we conclude, I just want to also uh, do a last acknowledgement, which is an animal death acknowledgement that we close out this event by honoring the 9 billion and counting lives lost just in the year 2023 to farming in the United States. And we all acknowledge their continued exploitation in our daily lives. We make them visible, their experiences visible, and we honor their lives and hold space to remember them. Um, so thank you all for coming and please feel free. I will put my email up on the board and you can please email me with any questions that you have after the event. Yeah.